Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You know, I'm sure, that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a brand new series on the book of Revelation. Uh, this particular lesson is lesson number one in that series for January 5 of 2019, entitled The Gospel from Patmos. Now, we're used to talking about Gospels like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but this is talking about the Gospel from Patmos, so we're going to have to find out what that is. But as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we are sometimes amazed and stand surprised that you use the very interesting and unusual methods for reaching out to your children here on this earth. Imagine giving messages to one of your aged friends uh, hidden somewhere away in the uh, reaches of who knows where on the Isle of Patmos, presumed by the Roman government to be out of touch with the world. And there you reached out to him and left us this marvelous book for us to study. Help us as we now study it, that we may represent you correctly, we may think about your character, and learn what we need to know is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We need to recognize that the book of Revelation begins with the acknowledgement that very few people could actually read in those days. It just wasn't one of the skills that people learned. And not many actually went to school, especially women. Virtually no women went to school. And so what would happen if a letter or a book or something like this came to a church group, someone who was able to read would stand up and read it out loud and the rest would listen. So that's why the book starts out, Blessed he who reads and those who hear. So that's what we're talking about. And I just wonder, how much of the book of Revelation would you be able to understand if you just heard it read out loud to you one time? Mm -hmm. I see everybody that's smiling. That much. <laughs> about that much, is <laughs> right. They didn't read very much at a time. Yeah, they, they must have, you know, read a little bit maybe and talked about it, read a little bit. But remember, they would have known the, the different churches that were talked about, they would know people who were involved in those churches and so forth. So, and they, they probably talked about some of these things on a regular basis. So at least some of the background would be more familiar to them. Particularly um, to the Jewish, uh, those who had grown up in Judaism would recognize many of the uh, illustrations and allusions and references to Old Testament uh, sayings and such that they would probably gain a little bit yeah. more since they already had a bit of a background whereas the Greeks may not so much unless they yeah. had steeped themselves in the Old Testament. Well one thing is pretty certain it wasn't intended as primarily to be directed to the Roman soldiers on the island of Patmos. Right. <laughs> they probably yeah. looked at it and they said in fact it was almost code to the yeah sent out so that the Roman soldiers didn't know what it meant. Yeah, they probably thought this old guy is crazy. Now, we don't know for sure how this book got to Ephesus. You can, I had the privilege of, a couple years ago of taking a boat from Ephesus, or just near Ephesus, out through the narrow passage main, by the island Samos, and on to Patmos, and then back again. And uh, uh, it's not that far. It's a 45 minute drive or some ride or something like that on a fast boat. Um, but, you know, the, the Romans clearly thought that Patmos and a couple of other small islands out there were the end of the world and nobody was ever going to get any message back. But we know that John, after a period of time, was released and allowed to go back to Ephesus. Did he keep the book and take it with him when he went back to Ephesus? Or he did somehow or other figure out how to get it to Ephesus? While he was still on Patmos, we just don't know. Or did he write it in Ephesus from memory? Of that's, what happened to him? That's also, but he seems to talk as if he's writing from Patmos, and most people would 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 say that. Um, but it's possible he wrote it when he got back to Ephesus. That's a remote possibility, I would say. What did he have on Patmos to write it on? Exactly. That that would be the huge question. Yeah. We do have the example of another book that was rewritten from memory. Mm -hmm. The book of Jeremiah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's pretty clear to those who study the original languages involved in Scripture that 
John is thinking in Hebrew or Aramaic. His basic language would be Aramaic, but he probably read at least some Hebrew as well because the Bible was written in Hebrew, except for little sections in Aramaic and Esther and Daniel. Um, but he was probably thinking in Aramaic and writing in Hebrew. So he makes some minor grammatical errors. You know, lang Greek wasn't his first language. And uh, those he was are not... writing in Greek. He was writing in Greek. But th those little errors don't, aren't enough to, to bother anybody. It's clear what he intended. Um, when I try to speak Spanish to my patients, they usually can figure out what I'm talking about, but it's not perfect Spanish. <laughs> Any, any idea why he chose not to write in Hebrew or Aramaic? Well, Hebrew was a dead language almost by the days of Jesus. It was read only by the scholars who actually were reading the Bible on a fairly regular basis. Aramaic was the language which they were forced to use when they went to Babylon under, in Babylonian captivity. It was the language of Nebuchadnezzar, actually. He brought it up from southern Iraq. To when, when he took over in, in Babylon, he forced everybody to speak the language of southern Iraq. It wasn't even the original language of Babylon. But then anybody who was there under, as prisoners and so forth, were required to speak that language. So when the, the Jews had been speaking that language for a number of years, they went back to Jerusalem. They, so the language of Jesus was Aramaic. So, well, you, it's already been mentioned that uh, there's a lot of references to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation and we have some words about that. Gordon, I think you have something. From C. Mervyn Maxwell from God Cares, Volume 2. Of the 404 verses in Revelation, 278 contain material directly from the Old Testament. There are some 600 words or phrases adapted directly from the Old Testament. Some believe that number goes up to 1,000. So, wow. So, that's another indication that he was not writing to the Roman soldiers on the Isle of Patmos. He was clearly writing to a group of, of Christians who would be fairly well acquainted with the Old Testament, as we call it, what they would call their Bible, um, and the books there, and so that they understood some of these code words that uh, might not be immediately evident even to us unless we're very familiar with um, what's written in the Old Testament. We know that John quoted from a number of books of the Old Testament. His favorites were in order. Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Psalms, Exodus, Jeremiah, and Zechariah. He was also very familiar with the apocalyptic books written between the times of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And you can read about that more from uh, various scholars, including William Barclay. John lived at a very difficult time for Christians. Before being exiled to the Isle of Patmos, as a political and religious prisoner, he was thrown into a pot of boiling oil, but was protected by God and had to be removed by the very soldiers who threw him into that pot. And for Adventists, you can see that documented in Acts of the Apostles, page 570. For those of you who want to go back to the original sources, you can find, look under the Antis Nicene Fathers, the very earliest post-Christian writings in volume 3, chapter 36, 1.3.1.11.0.36. Uh, so um, if you want to find it back there. Later, John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos as an attempt to stop his influence on others. I mean, surely if you send him out to the Isle of Patmos, he, his influence will die, right? Well, how do we date the book of Revelation? Well, first of all, we look at the internal evidence and the testimony of the early church leaders. Those testimonies almost universally identified John, the writer of this book, as being John, the apostle of Jesus Christ. And we would absolutely agree with that. In fact, Ellen White clearly supports that. But there's a second line of evidence that many people don't think about, perhaps, revealed in a completely new attitude toward Rome and the Roman Empire. In the book of Acts, Paul was repeatedly protected by the fact that he was a Roman citizen. Uh, he, he would have been killed right in the temple in Jerusalem if the Roman guards had, or the Jewish, possibly Jewish guards working for the Romans came down and protected him and, and brought him away from the crowd. But when we come to the book of Revelation, things are very different. Look at these words. 
Terry, I think you have something on that. Yes, in the book of Acts, Paul was repeatedly protected by the fact he was a Roman citizen. In the Revelation. Go ahead, yeah. keep going. When we come to the book of Revelation, things were very different. Consider this, in the Revelation, there is nothing but blazing hatred for Rome. Rome is a Babylon, the mother of harlots, drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs. That's from Revelation 17, verses 5 to 6. John hopes for nothing but her total destruction. The explanation of this change in attitude lies in the wide development of Caesar worship, which in its accompanying persecution is the background of the Revelation. That's from the Revelation of John, a commentary on the book of Revelation by William Barclay. By the time John was writing the book of Revelation, there had been a huge change in the attitude of the Roman government toward other religions. It was not their intent to do away with other religions. They, they realized it would be a bad step to try to oppose everybody's religions, but instead to superimpose the worship of Rome and the Caesars on top of those other religions. Originally, the idea was to worship Rome itself. But before long, that worship began to focus on the Caesars themselves. In its earliest stages, this worship was promoted by the citizens themselves. They said, you know, if you want to get in good with the Caesar, you say, well, you know, we're going to worship you, we're going to do all this kind of stuff. So they chose to worship not only Rome, but also Julius Caesar. He was the first one that we know of, was clearly they attempted to worship him. Caesar Augustus, who came along shortly thereafter, died in AD 14, allowed allowed that worship. Tiberius Caesar, who ruled from AD 14 to 37, and he would be the one who was Caesar during the days of Jesus, could not halt the Caesar worship. Whether he really tried or not, I don't know, but he couldn't halt it. But he forbade temples or priests to be appointed to worship him. So he says, you can worship Julius Caesar if you want, you can worship Augustus if you want, but no, you know, you can't worship me. Caligula, who ruled from AD 37 to 41, was an epileptic, a madman, and a megalomaniac. He insisted that he be personally worshipped while he was alive. Prior to his day, the Jews had always been exempted from worshipping Rome or the Caesars. However, Caligula tried to force it on them as well. Fortunately, he died before he could enforce that ruling. Caligula was succeeded by Claudius, who ruled from AD 41 to 54, and who completely reversed the insane policies of his predecessor. Nero, of course he was the one who killed Peter and Paul, ruled from AD 54 to 68. While he persecuted Christians, he never took his own divinity seriously and did nothing to insist on Caesar worship. He was only looking for scapegoats because of the great fire in Rome which he himself had started. And you know that he accused Jews and he accused Christians of somehow starting this fire. I think he did it more than once. After Nero died, there were three emperors in 18 months, Galba, Otto, and Vitellius. There was no time during those brief reigns to talk about Caesar worship. The next two emperors, Vespasian, who ruled from AD 69 to 79, and he was the one who first conquered Judea and surrounded Jerusalem and looked like it, Jerusalem was going to fall. And then all of a sudden he heard that the previous Caesar was gone and he rushed home to see if he, to prove that he was the next Caesar. And he, of course he accomplished that job. But that's why the Roman army left Jerusalem for that four year period and the Christians had a chance to escape. <coughs> then his son, uh, uh, I'm saying, uh, his son Titus ruled from 79 to 81. They were wise rulers and made no insistence on Caesar worship. Then came Domitian, who ruled from 81 to 96, that's 15 years. He brought a complete change. He was a devil. He was a cold-blooded persecutor and demanded Caesar worship. Whereas Caligula was an insane devil, Domitian was a sane devil. He insisted on the worship of Titus and Vespasian, and he insisted in many different ways that he be recognized as a god. So what were Christians to do? Christians were regarded as outlaws, to be hunted down and killed. For more details again, see the Revelation of St. John by William Barclay. The book of Revelation is end-oriented. By that we mean that the emphasis was always on the end of each vision, the second coming of Jesus Christ, 
and beyond. So we're going to see those sevens that you know are repeated in the book of Revelation. But it's at the end of each of those sevens, there's a, an emphasis, and it's always on the end. Well, look at Revelation 1, verses 1 and 2. This book is the record of the events, and I'm going to make this a little bit larger, so perhaps it'll be easier for people to read. This book is the record of the events that Jesus Christ revealed. God gave them this revelation in order to show his servants what must happen very soon. Is that a past, present, or a future statement? Future. It's future. Mm -hmm. Christ made these things known to his servant John by sending his angel to him. And John is told all that he has seen. This is his report concerning the message from God and the truth revealed by Jesus Christ. So, we recognize anybody who's read the book of Revelation, no matter whatever language it is, uh, realizes it's very apocalyptic, what we call ap apocalyptic language. It would have been probably unintelligible to the Roman soldiers on Patmos. It is all about how God wins the great controversy by revealing the truth about his character and his government through Jesus Christ. Apocalypsis, that's the Greek title of Revelation, means unveiling or uncovering, and it is an uncovering of Jesus Christ. It is both from Jesus and about him. It is his self-revelation to his people down through the generations from the time of his ascension until his second coming. He is a central figure of the entire book. The book begins with him, Revelation 1, 5 to 8, and ends with him, Revelation 22, 12 to 16. Well, virtually all Christians recognize that the Gospels are the story of Jesus' time on this earth. The book of Acts and Revelation pick up that story and extend it to the third coming of Jesus. Now, we've discussed this in this class before, but remember that the millennium and the third coming are first mentioned only in the book of Revelation. So, people like Peter and Paul and, and nobody except John, none of the disciples except John uh, knew anything about the millennium or the third coming. Only at the end of, of the John's life, clear down somewhere around 90 A.D., did there, that John was just told about the millennium and the third coming. Furthermore, the books of Revelation and Hebrews further enlighten us by talking about the ministry of Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, how many other Christian groups besides Seventh-day Adventists have an emphasis on the heavenly sanctuary? None. None. None at all. We think the sanctuary is important because we, we look at the, the sequence of events that happened in the Jewish holy year and we recognize that there's parallels to those sequences in the history of our world. And how many in the Adventist church value yeah. the heavenly sanctuary? Yeah, and really understand what it's all about. While this point is disputed by some, we firmly believe that Revelation was written by the Apostle John, the same one who wrote the Gospel of John in the three short letters 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. There are reasons for that. There are some few places in the book of Revelation where there are very, very typical Johannine statements that are in the Gospel and also in the book of Revelation, not found anywhere else in the Bible. It's unfortunate that many of us have not had the opportunity to study in depth the biblical languages. Very early in the book of Revelation, it ties itself in the Greek to the book of Daniel. Together, these two books have become key books for us, who are, those of us who are Seventh-day Adventists. Many critical scholars, and here's where the huge divide comes, even though they call themselves Christians, do not believe that even God is able to predict the future. Hmm. This means that the book of Revelation poses a very serious interpretive problem for them. Already in chapter 1, Revelation says several times that it is talking about future events. Even in our day, many of the events pictured in the book of Revelation are still future. I mean, have we had the millennium yet? No, not absolutely not. Have we had the second coming? Have we had the third coming? Absolutely not. So m many parts of Revelation are talking about things still in the future for us. Well, look at De Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. As soon as I can get to my... There we come. 
There are some things that the Lord our God has kept secret, but he has revealed his law, and we and our descendants are to obey it forever. He has revealed his law, we and our descendants are to, re are to obey it forever. Look at Revelation 22, 7 by comparison. Listen, says Jesus, I am coming soon, happy of those who obey the prophetic words in this book. So that's what we're going to try to do. The book of Revelation is clearly intended to warn us and to encourage us by pointing, us out, pointing out that very difficult times uh, will take place before the final victory of God's people and our eternal reward in heaven. God tells us only as much as he realizes we need to know. This is not an attempt to scare us into a particular behavior. And we have been warned about that. Um, Charles, I think, are you the one next one Dennis. there? Yeah, or Dennis? Dennis, I'm sorry. Shortness Dennis. of time is urged as an incentive for us to seek righteousness and to make Christ our friend. This is not the great motive. It savors of selfishness. It is necessary, is it necessary that the terrors of the day of God be held before us to compel us through fear to right action? This ought not to be. Jesus is attractive. He is full of love, mercy, and compassion. He proposes to be our friend, to walk with us through all the rough paths, r pathways of life. Ellen White, uh, Review and Herald, August 2nd, 1881, paragraph 6. For those of you who know a little bit about the life story of Ellen White, this was written just about one month before her husband died. Hmm. Mm. He died, I believe it was August 6th of 1881, and this, of course, would have had to be turned into the Review and Herald probably two or three weeks before that. So, wow. about, he was quite sick, and uh, she was thinking about the future at that point, I'm sure. So, by looking at history, we know that many people have tried to predict the time of the second coming. And how often have they succeeded? They have Never. failed. Zero. Everybody who's tried to predict it in the past has failed. It hasn't happened yet, right? The prophecies in the Bible were not written so that we could spell out future events in detail. They were written so that what? When, thing when happen, things we happen, we can recognize that God knew in advance and we can know that he is still in control. Let's just look at a couple of those verses. Look at John 13, verse 19. I tell you this now, this is Christ speaking to his disciples in the upper room just shortly after he had washed their feet. I tell you this now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. When Jesus said, I am who I am, what was he saying? I am God. Why do you say I am God? Why, why, why do you Burning bush. That okay. was the expression that God used speaking through. I am. Excellent. I, I was, I am, and I always will be. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? Yahweh. Yahweh. Yeah. It's the four letter name, the personal name of God, Yahweh. And that's what it means. It, it means the closest translation of that word is to be. There's no pa past, present, or future. It's, it's the word of existence, the word of being, the word of... That's why people sometimes they translate it the eternal one, they translate the I am, uh, different ways to try to express the idea that God is forever present. So Jesus here, speaking to his disciples, and who else had he spoken about like this to prior to this? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Yeah. Nicodemus, yeah, but very specifically, not just to Nicodemus. Who else? Well, the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, I think. Okay, he recognized that he was the Messiah. Not that he was God, but he was the Messiah. But there was another very important time. Anybody? Turn for a second to. For Abraham was, I am. Yeah, where does that come from? Well, it's in John. To? Okay, yeah. look, at, look at the Gospel of John, chapter 8. First of all, in verse 24, Jesus is speaking to the Sanhedrin. Mm -hmm. These are the religious, political powerhouse of, of, of Judea, of the, of the Jewish people. And he says, that is why I told you that you will die in your sins. This is what he, remember, he's speaking to the Sanhedrin. 
and you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am who I am. And they apparently didn't realize what he was, what he was saying. They just said, well, who are you? And then he dropped down a couple of verses and he says, verse 28, so he said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am who I am. They went into apoplexy. <laughs> they, they should have. But they didn't yet. Look at down to verse 52, is it, I think? And it's actually beyond that. 58. I'm telling you that they said to him, you're not even 50. He talked to said, I, and Abraham saw my day and he was glad. They said to him, you're not even 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? And then he finally said in words that they couldn't possibly misunderstand, I am telling you the truth. Jesus replied, before Abraham was born, I am. And there was no question about what he was saying there. The third time, what did they do? They picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and left the temple. Imagine Jesus speaking those words. Of course, you know, in that same, in, same uh, discourse, he said, and you are of your father, the devil. The devil yes. Wow. He must have figured that he would not get a whole lot of opportunities to address himself to this. <laughs> He's going to lay it all out on the table in one, one speech. The question I have is, who recorded that speech? Did Jesus come and tell his disciples later? Did he tell John so he could write it down? Did the Holy Spirit or tell, tell it to John in a vision? Yeah. Did awesome. Jesus tell it? Yeah. Well, maybe Nicodemus was there too. He, Nicodemus was there. He was mm -hmm. a member of the Sanhedrin. No question. And Joseph of Arimathea mm -hmm. were there. So they, they could recount what happened. Yeah. So we don't know exactly how the information got to John. We'll have to ask him someday. Yeah. By looking at history, we know that many people have tried to predict the time of the second coming and failed. The prophecies in the Bible were not written, as we already mentioned, um, to tell. So look at another verse that supports that. Look at John 14, 29. As soon as I can get my cursor to the right place here on the page. I have told you this now before it all happens. This is still in the upper room so that when it does happen, you will believe. And then again, finally, in chapter 16, verse 4, I believe it is here. Uh, I went roaring right past it. I did not tell you these things at the beginning for, for I was with you. Um, hold on. It's verse... Yeah, oh, but I have told you this so that when the time comes for them to do these things, you remember that I told you. So basically the same idea. Three places there in, in one evening, Jesus said that to them. The book of Revelation is full of language which seems strange to us. This language is called symbolic language or apocalyptic language. What do we mean when we say apocalyptic language? In time in events. In time. Language is particularly focused on predicting or telling us about end time events, yeah. But Revelation is not the first book to use such language. Revelation, look at Revelation 13, 1, Daniel 7, 1, Ezekiel 1, um, and other places. So why all these strange talk about weird beasts, horns, creatures, animals, etc.? I mean, couldn't God have just come straight out and told us? What he had to say? No. We've gotten so used to all these strange things that we're sort of, we sort of just, oh, that's part of the Bible, yeah, I can't write. But God could have told us exactly. So why is he talking about beasts and all these things? Well, back in Daniel, he did the same thing mm -hmm. with lots of uh, beasts and various things. So that's one other tie between the two books that says mm -hmm. we need to think about them together. Well, it lets us, and clearly, when you look at the fact that the, the beasts in, in, in Revelation very clearly are related to the, books, to the beasts in Daniel, that's a clue. That helps us. And it, it, it's a way of letting us know that, you know, it, it, it's a way of 
po possibly it's a way of, of not informing the, the enemies of God's church, but informing the, the friends of God. Well, Revelation 1.1 1, 1 gives us some hints about that. If you know, if you look at the original language, he sent and signified by his angel his, to his servant John. And that's the, origin, that's the translation in the New King James Version. And the word signified there comes from a Greek word, semaino, which means to show by symbolic signs. The same expression is used in Daniel 2.45. God signifies to the king what will take place in the future. So John was doing his best to describe in human language and through the use of symbols what he had seen in vision. So Charles, got some yes, words sir. on that? Thus, for the most part, the language used to describe uh, Revelation's prophecies must not be interpreted literally. As a rule, the reading of the Bible in general presupposes uh, a literal understanding of the text, unless the text points to the intended symbolism. But when we read Revelation, unless the text points to a literal meaning, we need to interpret it symbolically. While the sacred, while the sins and the events predicted are real, they usually are expressed in symbolic language. Keeping in mind the largely symbolic character of Revelation will safeguard us against distorting the prophetic messages. Message. In trying to determine the meaning of the symbols used in the book, we must be careful not to impose on the text a meaning that comes out of human Im imagination or the current meanings of these symbols in our culture. Instead, we must go to the Bible and to the symbols of symbols found in its pages in order to understand the symbols of the Book of Revelation, Adult uh, Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Okay, well this is a very important point. Uh, people have gone all sorts of cr into all sorts of craziness by imposing on the book of Revelation ideas from their background and their culture and their times. So we need to be very careful to say, okay, John was the one who was writing. He was inspired by God, but John is communicating with people who live in his day, first primarily in that sense. So we need to say, okay, look at the context of the rest of the Bible and see what that particular sequence of words or that particular idea, what did it mean to the people in Bible times and try to interpret the, the passages in that context, not by imposing some of our ideas on it. And we've already suggested earlier, a careful reading of the Old Testament, comparing it with the book of Revelation, will reveal that almost all of the symbols used in Revelation were previously used somewhere in the Old Testament. So surely it would be helpful to be very acquainted, very well acquainted with the Old Testament before you read the book of Revelation. This is a strong hint to us that God has a panoramic view. He sees the end from the beginning and back again of the great controversy from the beginning to end. John's greeting in Revelation 1, 11 pointed out that to the churches uh, to whom he had initially addressed this letter. His greeting was similar in form to uh, a greeting given by Paul in Romans 1, 7. And you can look at Revelation 1. We, we probably have a moment to do that. Look at Revelation 1, 4 and 5. From John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, Grace and peace be yours from God who is, who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits in front of his throne. Now, and from Jesus Christ I should read, the faithful witness, the first to be raised from death, and who is also the ruler of the kings of the world. That expression, who is, who was, and who is to come, when I, as, as a young person, read this, I thought, okay, he's just talking about who he was in the past, he is in the present, and he will be there in the future. No, this says literally, he's coming to this world. He is, he was, he was, he is, and he's coming back. That's, that's the word in Greek is not just talking about a future, something that happens in the future, it's talking about someone who is actually coming in the future. And compare, yeah? 
comment? Well, you, I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, That's right. But uh, uh, when we get to the seventh trumpet, um, which uh, uh, is sort of the end of all things, um, where is it now? Um, oh, uh, verse 17, we give you thanks, what, Lord what, God. I mean what chapter? Uh, uh, 11. 11. Romans, uh, Revelation 11, 17, okay? We give thanks, uh, we give you thanks, O God, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, mm -hmm. because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Yeah. So that to come is not there, except in the sense mm -hmm. of the immediate. He has, he has come and it has yeah. begun to reign. Well, this expression, who was, who is, and is to come, occurs two or three times in the book of Revelation. Yeah. So look at uh, Revelation 1, 7. So I write to all of you in Rome whom God loves and is called to be his own people. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. What's the significance of grace and peace? Without grace there's no peace. Yeah, that's a very good point. Exactly. Well, it turns out that the Greek word the, the Greek greeting, if you just went down the street and, and said hi to somebody, is the word kyrene, or hyrene. And um, here I might just move my, there it is. Um, so J Paul said, I'm not going to, I'm going to do that. I'm going to walk down the street and I'm going to say charis instead of kyrene. Charis means, is the word for grace. Mm -hmm. So it became the Christian greeting. The Christian greeting is charis. And the Hebrew greeting from the Old Testament is shalom, which is the meaning for peace. So when Paul and John and others say, mention grace and peace in their greetings, they're really saying to all you Jewish Christians, uh, all you uh, Greek-speaking Christians, and all to you Hebrew-speaking Jewish Christians. So um, it's a little background to that. John went on to specifically mention the three members of the Godhead as sending greetings. Revelation 1.8 and Revelation 4.8 speaking of the Lord God Almighty who is, who was, and who is to come. It's another one of those passages. I think I got this too big now. Okay. Um, as students, uh, I'm sorry. <coughs> <coughs> The Holy Spirit is referred to as the seven spirits of God. Compare Revelation 4, 5 and Revelation 5, 6. As students of Scripture, we recognize the number seven is a number implying completeness. In this case, it was talking about the Holy Spirit's witness to all seven churches. The seven spirits are also called the seven lamps in Revelation 4, 5 and the seven eyes of the Lamb in Revelation 5, 6. Jesus himself is identified by three different titles, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, all in Revelation 1, verse 5. These titles clearly refer to his death on the cross, his resurrection, and his reign in heaven. So you can already just get a feel for the fact that every word, every phrase in Revelation has a connection to something that, so a person who has all that background information is reading, bringing a lot of extra information to the text as, you, as they read along. The expression, he loves us, in Revelation 1.5 is a Greek form which has no beginning or ending. Again, like the name of God. God's love for us is past, present, and future. More than that, he has released us from our sins. Again, the Greek form of the verb suggests that that is a completed act. It's done. Finished. God's done with it. It is God's plan to take us to heaven and seat us on thrones as citizens of heaven beside Jesus Christ himself. Well, um, we don't have time to read these, but if you read Revelation 1, 7, and 8, and you compare chapter 22, verses 7, 12, and 20 with Daniel 7, 13, and 14, Zechariah 12, 13, and Matthew 24, 30, you'll discover that in Revelation, God, God, through John, I guess we should say, as sort of summarizing messages that he got from the Old Testament and from Matthew. Um, and what was that message is? Well, look at, look at just, we can read Revelation 1, 7 again. Look, he's coming on the clouds. Everyone will see him. 
including those who pierced him. All peoples on earth will mourn over him, so shall it be. I am the first and the last, says the Lord God Almighty, who is, who has, and is to come. So, all through the book of Revelation, we will see clearly, clear indications that the future God plans for us comes when he returns to this earth as the king of the universe. And, Ren, could you please uh, read us the next passage there? Yeah. More than 1800 years have passed since the Savior gave the promise of his coming. Throughout the centuries, his words have filled with courage the hearts of his faithful ones. The promise has not yet been fulfilled. The life giver's voice has not yet called sleeping saints from their graves. But nonetheless, sure is the word that, was, that has been spoken. In his own time, God will fulfill his word. Shall any become weary now? Shall we lose our hold on faith when we are so near eternal world? Shall any say that the city is a great way off? No, no. A little longer and we shall see the king in his beauty. A little longer and he will wipe away all tears from our eyes. A little longer and he will present us faultless before the presence of his glory, the exceeding joy. Ellen White, The Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, November 13th, 1913, paragraph 18. Very good, thank you. We recognize that a promise is only as valid as the one who made the promise. Could a promise be any more secure than one given by God himself? I don't know where you would find it. We have just briefly touched on the book of Revelation. Ellen White had some very strong words to say about the importance of studying the books of Daniel and Revelation, which should in inspire us to do that. Uh, Jim? When the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, believers will have an entirely different religious experience. Wow. They will be given such glimpses of the open gates of heaven that heart and mind will be impressed with a character that all must develop in order to realize the blessedness which is to be the reward of the pure in heart. And she wrote that in around 1900 from Australia. Yeah, wonderful. Very good. That a, that's beautiful. Well, Margaret, I think you have some additional words from Ellen White there. Mm -hmm. This revelation was given for the guidance and comfort of the church throughout the Christian dispensation. A revelation is something revealed. The Lord himself revealed to his servant the mysteries contained in his book, and he designs that they shall be open to the study of all. Its truths are addressed to those living in the last days of this earth's history, as well as to those living in the days of John. Some of the scenes depicted in, his in this prophecy are in the past. Some are now taking place, and some bring to view the close of the great conflict between the powers of darkness and the prince of heaven, and some reveal the triumphs and joys of the redeemed in the earth made new. Let none think, because they cannot explain the meaning of every symbol in the Revelation, that it is useless for them to search this book in an effort to know the meaning of the truth it contains. The one who revealed these mysteries to John will give it to the diligent searcher for truth, a foretaste of heavenly things. Those whose hearts are open to the reception of truth will be enabled to understand its teachings and will be granted the blessing promised to those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. It's Ellen G. White, The Acts of the Apostles, page 583, Paris, paragraph 1, anyway. To 585, paragraph 0. So it goes up onto the next page. So why do many Christians today avoid reading and studying the book of Revelation? Because their pastors are telling them you can't. You can't, can't understand it. Yeah. I remember I had a friend who did some touring around England and asking people questions, what they knew about the Bible and so forth. And he found a Sunday school teacher. Said, okay, what, how do you, how do you, what do you do with the book of Revelation? Oh, we never study the book of Revelation. <laughs> some of you know who did that. Yeah. Many people have tried to base future predictions of their own on the book of Revelation. They have utterly failed in their attempts at predicting the time of the second coming. And I, I'm sure all of you 
keep your ears on the news fairly close, you know that there are people, people predicting the end of the world every few months. Some, and it gets on to national news, and maybe that's why they do it. I don't know, but you, you think after a while they would learn, you know, this is a risky kind of business. <laughs> if you want to be, you want people to believe what you have to say. Well, in this lesson, we've studied the first eight verses of the book of Revelation. We've had no terrifying beasts, no heavenly journeys, and no sevenfold sequences. We have learned that Jesus is the central figure of the book of Revelation. The book concerns future events which are pictured in symbolic language which must be carefully interpreted. In this symbolic language, we have numerous links to the Old Testament books, particularly the book of Daniel. So I'm going to ask you to help me here for a moment. Why do you think that so many people think that God himself can't predict the future? Where do they get that idea? Of course, there, in our day, there are many people who don't believe God even exists. Yeah. I think one of the reasons is that, you know, that, uh, that they don't like that idea, or they can't uh, wrap their mind around it, is you wouldn't be free to, to have free, freedom of choice if God knows the future. It just it doesn't fit with their paradigm, and so they do too yeah, much. And, and, and furthermore, that I mean, a specific point of that would be if you don't believe God can predict the future, then you don't believe that he's going to stand up there and judge you someday. Well, you, That's know, another you might part take exception that. to that word, ju judge you. Well, we, I'm, I'm, ta I'm talking about how they perceive Oh, that. they perceive, yeah, their perception, because I, I, th I look at the, the, uh, the words Jesus has spoken, he said, will be your judge. Yeah. He doesn't need to have a judgment scene. No. It's just, uh, he, he's given you the truth, and, and which side are you... Have you chosen? Yeah. It's, it's real, real and who is it simple. That, who is it that told us that? John. Yeah. It's very clear. John 3, John 5, John 12. It's very clearly spelled out there how the judgment takes place. Yes, Dennis. Well, there is a way around that. Even if you don't <coughs> know exactly what's going to <coughs> take place, to the extent that you can control the future, you can predict it. Yeah. So in two seconds, my hand's going up. One, two. So there it went. So was I foreseeing the future? Yeah. To the extent that God could control the future, he could predict, you know, particularly a, uh, you know, Daniel 7 where mm -hmm. uh, the judgment is set and the books are open and they review things and such. If he knows that's going to happen and he has control to make it happen, then he could yeah. predict it. What we have is a case of the infinite one being judged by finite in intelligent creatures, you know, uh, who, who in this room or anybody that you know of it, can tell us what the it, limits are of the infinite one. Mm -hmm. By definition, it can't be done. Uh, let's just take a moment and turn to John chapter 3, where it very specifically talks about how the judgment takes place. <coughs> I'm going to read not John 3.16, which is a very, very familiar verse, but starting with John 3.17 and following. For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. So as Jim has already suggested, the truth about the judgment is that we judge ourselves by right. choosing which side. Do we, do we run from the light or do we come to the light? So uh, we don't need to be afraid of the judgment, but those who who are afraid of the judgment, don't want God to be up there. And of course, how many religions, how many preachers and others have down through the generations have said, you ought to do exactly what God says or he will burn you forever in hell. Yeah. I got a, a, a friend, a mutual friend of ours says, was referring to John 6 and he says, uh, all are called, but few are chosen. Mm -hmm. And I says, a better way to translate that would be, uh, few choose. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it, essence choose, okay? Mm -hmm. it, it, but uh, it, otherwise, it just uh, it doesn't it doesn't compute. 
Well, in this, we've already looked at the first eight, eight verses of the book of, of Revelation, uh, and we've seen, that was the other thing I wanted to ask you, what really jumps out in your mind compare, that compares the book of Revelation to the book of Daniel? What comes to your mind when I say Daniel and Revelation? What fits them together? It's not supposed to be a difficult uh, question. Well, for one thing, the, the, the being that came to talk to Daniel mm -hmm. yeah. is the same being that came and talked to John. Appeared exactly the same yes. in many references, in many yes. respects, yes? Anything else you can think of? Well, there's um, all the, the symbolic language in both. There are mm -hmm. the prophecies in both. There's, there's very specifically the uh, 1260 days, there's three and a half years, there's 42 months. Both in Daniel and Revelation, there's an example. And interestingly, when we first study further along in the book of Revelation, we're going to talk about these seven-headed and ten-horned beasts. And where does the seven-headed, ten-horned ten beasts come from? Right out of Daniel 7. If you take those beasts, those four beasts from Revelation, I mean from Daniel 7, and you put them all together, and what you do? What do you get? You get a seven-headed, ten-horned beast. So there's very close relationship between those, those two books. And their summations have similarities too yeah. at the end where they speak of, oh, yeah. of uh, the end of things, you know, Daniel's to go to rest and uh, uh, keep, you know, rest and rise again at the allotted portion mm -hmm. at the end of the age. And, and then the summations that Jesus yeah. gives here at the end of Revelation. Well, we say that we are using the historicist method of interpretation. What does that mean? Anybody? That there's that a his. It's played out over history. Yeah. Yes. We believe that John could predict the future, and that these prophecies God that he gave us. The future. What? God. They, well, yeah. Through and to John in this case. Yeah. Correct. I'm sorry. God can predict the future, and to John, he lays out. History reveals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what revelation is. But yeah. they use that word. Isn't apocalyptic or apocalypse mm -hmm. another way of saying revelation or reveal? Unfortunately, so, it's taken a, a lot of baggage that it's some yeah. event. Do we have a hard time, or do you out there have a hard time recognizing that God can predict the future? He says he does. Does it seem right to you that the predictions in the Book of Revelation are soon to take place? How long ago was soon? Yeah. <laughs> 2,000 years ago. Does that sound like soon? Not, well, not in our way of thinking. No, it doesn't. But what? C.S. Lewis sort of indirectly comments on that in his Chronicles of Narnia where uh, the lion Aslan says to the children, I'll see you soon. And they say, well, what, what do you mean by soon? And he says, I call all times soon. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. that was C.S. Lewis's way of getting around that. Peter, in his second book, chapter 3, verse 8, says, But do not forget one thing, my dear friends. There is no difference in the Lord's sight between one day and a thousand years. <coughs> to him, the two are the same. So that's one way to respond to that. And I keep reminding people that I talk to that it's not just God waiting for things to get bad enough or something else like that. God has to carefully work out the details of the great controversy and it has to come to a clear conclusion proving that God is fair, that he's honest, that he's loving and everything he's done before it can come to an end or otherwise the great controversy won't be over. So, so in this introductory chapter of the book of Revelation we are pointing to the fact that the ultimate outcome of Jesus' love expressed in his death and resurrection is to raise his people to the highest point possible status, kings and priests of God in heaven. That's the goal he has for all of us. By the way, as I'm writing, winding down here on this lesson, a lot of the historical material here you may not have available to you, so our handouts that we use here, we discuss, are available on our website at theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X. Dot org if you would like to see what we're looking at.
John's ideas were, which, were, which were no doubt based on direct revelations from God or a reflection of Daniel 7, 13 through 14 and Zechariah 12. Let me just read you a paragraph about this. Or actually, I'll guess, Jim, you're going to read that for us. The allusion to Zechariah is particularly interesting. Notice the parallels between Zechariah 12 and the book of Revelation. In Zechariah 12, 7 and 8, it is Yahweh who comes. In Revelation, it is Jesus who comes. In Zechariah 12.10, it is Yahweh who is pierced. In Revelation, it is Jesus who is pierced. In Zechariah, it is the inhabitants of Jerusalem who see God come. Zechariah 12. Oh, in Revelation. Eight, excuse me. Is, well, oh, yeah. It says Zechariah 12.8-10. Yeah. In Revelation, it is the whole earth that sees Jesus come. In Zechariah 12, 11 and 12, it is the clans of Jerusalem that mourn. In Revelation, it is the tribes of the whole earth that mourn from the adult Sabbath school, is that, uh, teacher Sabbath schools. Does that so. sound like the similarities between those? So mm -hmm. John is saying, you people who know about these things, you know what I'm talking about. You know that this is predicted long ago by prophets in the Old Testament. I'm just repeating this message and you know what, what it means. You know that Jesus, in fact, is coming again and so forth. And you know the story of Jesus' life and death and how he, how he was crucified and it was predicted right there in the Old Testament. So, we, we see that in the book of Revelation there's a shift, or even in the New Testament, if you will, an emphasis from Yahweh. Yahweh is, who is Yahweh? I am the God. I am. It's yeah. Jesus. It's Jesus well, yeah. Christ, even in the Old Testament. It is his personal name in the Old Testament. It's a shift from the name Yahweh in Hebrew to Jesus, which is, of course, a Greek name, which we have taken in English. There's also a shift from literal local things regarding Israel to the spiritual worldwide impact of the gospel and the church. Remember that in, Paul said in, Ephes, in, in Ephesians that this church, us, that's us here, are supposed to teach the onlooking universe something about God by the way we live and respond to God's love. That's a pretty amazing thing. We're, we're going to teach something to the angels who are standing next to the throne of God? Wow. That's in but of course, we see what God has done and how loving he's been toward us. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of studying these materials of learning more about you and of your love and kindness and care for us. We thank you again for the book of Revelation. In Jesus' name, amen.